This Homeschool Friday is a, a unusual format because a sort of an annual tradition here at the Relic Room that's grown up in our Homeschool Fridays uh, in December as the holidays get closer and we feel a little festive. So we integrate some uh, traditional dance instruction into our um, uh, program. Uh, as well as maybe near the holidays, we all get short tempers with each other. Maybe that's what brought it up. But uh, so our December program at the Relic Room for Homeschool Friday is traditionally uh, dueling and dancing, a highly interactive kind of thing. We get you into the atrium of the museum and teach you the Virginia Reel and so forth. That's not really an option in this year of our Lord 2020. So today's program instead, and I hope you all find, uh, find it worthwhile, is gonna consist of some stories and explanations of the customs of dueling and dancing uh, in antebellum, South Carolina, and a little bit beyond that as well. And uh, some people might feel like these customs don't have a, a common theme, uh, I think you'll see by the end of the session uh, that they do have a bit of a common theme. Uh, nevertheless, one of the best reasons to look over this session as part of your curriculum in studying history, um, and it's also a great benefit in studying literature, is to have a little context when these dramatic events are referred to. Uh, and when it's said that George Washington has a, has a ball at his plantation, that you'll have a, a little bit of a picture of how that worked, uh, and that your pictures of, of duels, those very dramatic incidents, they, they don't just come from Hollywood or Bugs Bunny cartoons or wherever else people get their ideas about dueling uh, these days. So with that said, Uh, we're going to launch into some stories, and by the way, we also have some wonderful artifacts to get a closer look at later that have to do uh, with these topics. And if there is a, a couple of common themes that run among these, um, customs. Customs are, are important things. Uh, we live in a society right now when a lot of things are done by, by formal laws or regulations that used to be handled uh, by well-known customs. Uh, everyone uh, more or less agreed on what the priorities were, what proper behavior was, uh, what upheld honor, what upheld you know, your, your integrity and your public reputation. Uh, and courtesy, courtesy, the rules of etiquette in these situations. Um, the rules of etiquette, as you'll see in a duel, were so formalized they could easily be compared to the rules of etiquette at a dance, which is, by the way, what will kick off with, this is a famous, really an, an iconic movie scene uh, from the uh, you know, award-winning award and groundbreaking film, Gone with the Wind, that formed so many people's impression of the old South. And it's a scene at a ball. And these, this picture of Southerners at the big, fancy, um, elaborate dances going through the paces of these group dances, uh, that's one that really sticks in our mind. Um, and here's a period illustration drawn of a ball. You don't get the same impression of color you do get an impression at the, the moment the artist chose to freeze here with his drawing of a, a sort of a military precision on the part of the men 
lined up there. Uh, the ladies, of course, they're, they're also lined up. Um, one aspect that makes doing dance interesting in the clothing of that era is those big giant hoop skirts you would find at such an event. Uh, if you ever dance a Virginia reel with ladies wearing hoop skirts, uh, you quickly find you're, you're bopping among them and they're flying off. Uh, the hoops are flying off in one direction and another and the, the whole scene becomes a little bit frenetic uh, and um, uh, joyous and, and a lot of fun. Uh, many of the dances were very stately uh, and other dances, particularly jigs and reels, were dances with a lot of energy in them. But what they had in common, they had a, a very strong um, and basically simple, once you were a little bit used to it, uh, choreography. There was a, a pattern that was well established and the whole group of people doing one of these dances uh, participated in continuing the pattern and making the pattern happen. It was a little bit of a different idea of dancing than, you know, we usually think of um, uh, perhaps ballroom dance. Um, there's no equivalent in this period, in this antebellum period of the, uh, you know, the dancing with the stars idea that two really good dancers sort of take over the room and, and everyone stops to watch how fantastically they dance. Um, that, that's something that popped up in a movie I watched last week. There's a scene where that happens uh, in, I guess it's set in the 1930s at the time um, in It's a Wonderful Life uh, where there's the dance contest and, and everyone stops and watches two dancers. That's not how dancing worked in this custom in the Old South that grew from what was called country dance in England uh, and came over the ocean. Uh, English country dance and Scottish country dance both came across the ocean with the immigrants and became established customs here in, uh, well, first the colonies and then in the United States. In fact, the well-known Virginia Reel sounds like it's named after one of our states. It was George Washington's favorite dance, but it's descended directly from a very different, uh, well, from it's the same dance with a different name from an English one that is much older. Uh, and so uh, you can see at any English country dance event, you'll see very familiar uh, our dances that would have been very familiar to people of the United States or of the colonies uh, uh, before the war. So a few differences with what we sort of think of as dance today. First of all, individual dances or really couple dances would be the right word. Uh, dances like the foxtrot and the waltz and so forth. Uh, those would come in later uh, in antebellum times, the group dances were the standard. And you still had a partner in a group dance, but uh, for instance, the uh, Virginia Reel, you wind up dancing with everybody in the entire group. Uh, you will turn them about and you move in and out of the pattern. And the group that does the dance sort of works as a team. So even though there is a designated partner. Still, basically dance uh, at this point is a group activity. Uh, and I was reading a terrific uh, book um, of an older lady's reminiscences of earlier times. Uh, the book is called Five Petticoats on Sunday. Uh, and she was of the generation who were doing their dances in the 1880s. 90s, except she wasn't dancing. And she, she describes lawn parties that worked in the exact same way as the formal dances did. Uh, and we'll get to why that was in just a minute. And it's kind of interesting. 
at these lawn parties, you had conversation partners that you went and, and sat with and spoke for a little while. And then you would turn around and go to a new one. And there were actually chaperones at the party to make sure you change partners fairly often. If you came into one of these dances as a, as a young soldier in 1862, when you get to go to a ball, uh, perhaps um, the, a, a midshipman at the Confederate States Naval Academy, they were invited to balls in Richmond all the time. And when it was time to select a partner, uh, you would go and request a dance from a young lady and the young lady would accept because the convention was that if she turns you down for a dance, then she doesn't dance that dance at all. It was not acceptable to turn somebody down that asked you and then accept the next guy to come up. You weren't supposed to sort of pick and choose in that fashion. Of course, there were scheming and politics to that, but none of it mattered too much because when the dance was over, you thank your partner and then you go ask another one. In fact, the assumption was if you danced more than two dances together as partners in the course of an evening, that you were engaged. So there wasn't a sort of, it, it was a very different atmosphere. Uh, the young men were not particularly afraid uh, of getting shot down. Um, generally, the young ladies very much wanted to dance and to accept a dance was not kind of an obligation. Um, it, was, it was not so much a romantic thing as a fun group activity, which also very naturally young men and young ladies dancing together it was very much part of their, their, their social life. Um, so it was a different atmosphere than what we think of as dances today. It's always fun at a reenactment to see modern young people who haven't done the old style dancing or understand how the customs work, uh, get used to it, um, begin to experience it and usually begin to really like it. Uh, again, one of the favorite dances of that era and the one that really comes down to us um, uh, as the most popular today uh, is the dance called the Virginia Reel. And for instruction in that one, be watching your calendar around December of 2021, which I hope is more of a sane year and we can have some interactive instruction in that wonderful old dance. An aspect of dancing though, remember I told you about that lady that um, in, in her hometown, they didn't have dances, they had lawn parties. And these lawn parties worked exactly the same, getting one partner for a few minutes and being moved to another partner, like a big slow motion dance, except there was no dancing to it. The same lady described um, how at parties, there would be folk songs that were, or the songs that were sung and played on the piano and how everyone would do the motions to these songs together in a coordinated way. It was a kind of a song game. What does it sound like? What's a, what's a, a song where everybody does the motions together? That's a dance. But that's not what she said because there was a religious divide over whether it was okay to dance or not. And she seems to have been on the side of, or maybe just trying not to offend the side that said dancing is morally wrong. Uh, we don't do dancing. One of the interesting things about the really fierce debates um, between some churches over whether it was okay to dance or not is those big debates didn't come from the later dancing where the man had his hand on the woman's waist and one couple would break off and do things by themselves and the part that you'd think would be where they, no. They didn't like the, the group dances. They didn't like the, uh, the, the Virginia Reel and dances like that were forbidden. What we would think would, would probably be very tame 
Uh, watch any film adaptation of a Jane Austen novel, and there will be at least one dance scene, usually, in there somewhere. Uh, and that's the kind of dance we're talking about. And that's the kind of dance that some churches were objecting very strongly to. And uh, my favorite local story about this, in the late 1840s, the two biggest churches in town here in Columbia, South Carolina, were Trinity Episcopal and First Presbyterian. And they were also the two big rival churches. And their traditions had gone different directions over the acceptability of dance. As far as I can tell, the Anglicans never had a problem with dancing. Um, 90% of the Jane Austen characters dancing, of course, in, in one of their ball scenes would all be Anglicans. Uh, on the other hand, the Scots Presbyterians did. And so in the late 1840s, Trinity Episcopal actually sponsored and uh, hosted a dance that was a fundraising dance for the Palmetto Regiment that was about to head off to the Mexican War. Well, a few of the young people from First Presbyterian Church attended that fundraising ball. And the ensuing controversy within the church was furious. Uh, you see, the young people were reprimanded by the elders of the church for going to the ball. And the reprimand was not enough for the pastor. The pastor at the time um, declared, he threatened to resign. And the pastor of First Presbyterian declared he had not come all the way from Scotland to be the pastor of a dancing church. Um, this would stay pretty strong. This is, this is a time when both of those churches also had disagreements over what kind of music was proper. Uh, but it would, be, it would remain a thing in some Southern churches and does to this day, uh, churches and religious colleges in our state uh, that still have rules about dancing. Now, once couple dances came in, you'll actually notice if you look at the um, dance card on your left here, this is a dance card from the 1880s. And the dances that are listed on this dance card they give both the, um, the kind of dance it is and the tune that's going to be played for it. Uh, you'll notice one of them um, is listed as contra, number eight there, contra. That's a corruption of the word country. Uh, and it's another word for one of the dance traditions that comes from English country dance. Most of them are quadrilles, which are group dances. But if you look at the other side of the card there, you'll see these are partners signed up in advance to dance. So your, your partner might come to you and, and you might even arrange before the dance. I'm going to dance number three and number 11 with you. Um, and during the dance, you can come up to a lady and ask for a dance. And that now she actually has the card that says, oh, no, I was already asked for this one. Of course, if his dance card is blank for that dance, she's still supposed to accept you. Uh, one of the things that would happen with these dance cards was they would wind up being saved as souvenirs. You've got everybody's signature there that was your partner. You have uh, you know, a, a record, a little document. They were made very fancy. Uh, and those really came in when couple dances began to be part of, or most of, events instead of the, um, uh, the older events where everything was a group dance. And this is a live tradition. Uh, here we see some local enthusiasts a couple of years ago, um, uh, including a particularly pretty lady in a blue dress there. Um, who are not, not reenacting or recreating, but actively participating in doing 
uh, dance in the old style. It's still a live tradition. It might be one that's a little bit on hold this year, of course, uh, although you can go uh, 19th century about it and make sure to wear gloves, perhaps that would make it more acceptable in the era of COVID. Uh, but there's several places in Colombia uh, and a couple of groups out there, if you go looking for them, that do English or Scottish uh, country dance or contra dance. Uh, and of course, reenactors often do dance as part of their uh, general impression. All right, moving to the other and very different custom uh, that we're discussing today, the custom of the duel. Uh, the evolution of dueling is very interesting. Uh, and, you know, it, it sticks in our minds because it's such a dramatic picture of two men with a difference to settle uh, going out and they're both going to do the most violent thing possible, which is try to kill each other, and also act according to very formal standardized rules as they do it. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's so dramatic and it's so ironic, it really grabs our imagination this idea of uh, a duel, a deadly fight over a point of honor. Well, dueling's history, uh, a lot of historians trace it back to what were called judicial duels in um, medieval times. Uh, and that was where when something could not be settled who was wrong or right in a court of law, the order would be, okay, you two fight it out with the idea being that God and justice would favor whoever was right in the case. So if other proof couldn't be found, uh, it, would, it would happen by whoever won the fight would be the person who should have won the fight. But it also comes from another source and was a way to reduce violence. Now that sounds kind of funny to allow a deadly fight to reduce violence. But if you think of uh, the plot of Romeo and Juliet, you have two families there uh, and all their retainers, powerful families and, and everybody that works for them have a feud going on. And when this feud is going on, it means that they're going to kill people from the other side. They're going to fight sometimes when they meet. There might be ambushes and acts of treachery. And every bad thing that happens tends to cause a reprisal of another bad thing being done in the other direction. It's a cycle of vengeance, the way the Middle East has operated for thousands of years, a cycle of vengeance. A duel was supposed to prevent a cycle of vengeance. When you had two men agree, this is the question at dispute, we're going to settle it on that date in this place. And when it's settled, it's done. That was the idea that instead of a feud that went on forever and involved many people, that only the two people with the main quarrel, that they would settle it themselves. And in fact, in Europe, over time, uh, the aristocrats came up with less and less deadly duels uh, until the small sword, uh, you know, we, we think of the sport of fencing, which is derived from using the small sword. Well, the small sword was already not necessarily the deadliest of weapons like its ancestor had been, uh, but they began to put a, a little three-pronged point on the end of it because a three-pronged point would only go as deep as the little fork that was made by it. And that couldn't kill anybody. Uh, and it could settle by first blood who won the encounter. And only aristocrats dueled. Well, as the custom crossed the ocean, like many things, Americans had the idea, we don't have this, this same difference in classes or aristocratic sensibilities of Europe. 
And many Americans viewed dueling very pragmatically. They looked at it as, I want to kill that guy. And under this custom, I'm permitted to do so. And so American choice of weapons was often particularly deadly. And the English in general did not believe that practicing pistol marksmanship for a duel was a good thing to do. They thought it, it's supposed to settle things a little bit randomly. It's not supposed to be about who's the better marksman, but about the fact that both of us are brave. Um, that wasn't the American idea. Uh, Americans who thought they might be involved in a duel often practiced ferociously with the pistol uh, in order to be a particularly good shot. Uh, by the way, there were sword duels in America, uh, but only one ever in South Carolina that I've been able to find in the 1790s. Uh, that was a special case, to say the least. Both men involved were fencing teachers. Uh, but the standard weapon in South Carolina was the single shot pistol. And there was a standard way to do things. In fact, it was a former governor of the state, John Lyde Wilson, who wrote a set of formal rules for dueling. He called it the code of honor, uh, rules for the for the governing of principles and seconds in dueling. And in the foreword to the book, he says, uh, he, he justifies himself in, in writing a book of rules for men to shoot each other in the proper way. Uh, he justifies it. Uh, he, he says that he's not exactly an advocate of dueling, that he wishes that everyone would work according to uh, a Christian code of turn the other cheek, and that every gentleman ought to be continually trying to keep from giving offense so that there'd never be any occasion for a duel because everyone else thinks of, everyone thinks of everyone else's sensibilities first. But he says that's not gonna happen. And since it's not going to happen, just as our nation had the right to seek redress against Great Britain for wrongs that were suffered, an individual man can seek redress. And that some things were not things that you could settle in the court. Uh, for instance, a man who's called a coward, um, it couldn't really do a lawsuit about that. But if he were to fight a duel, he can both get justice for the false accusation. He also proves the accusation false because would a coward stand there and let somebody else shoot at him? Uh, so Wilson said that dueling would be around as long as manly independence shall continue to exist. Uh, and he actually said, if we were to give up the custom of dueling, we might as well all forsake civilization and go live in the woods with the savages. Uh, so for a man who is not an advocate of dueling, he has some very strong ideas. But the strongest one, something interesting that comes across in the code. Um, the principles and dueling language, those are the two guys that are going to fight. Okay. The, the principles uh, are the man who gave the challenge and the man who accepted the challenge. Those are the principles. Each of them has someone appointed to act for him, uh, referred to as a second, also referred to as his friend. Um, so that if an insult was offered, uh, you said a terrible thing to another man, he was not supposed to insult you back. If, uh, if two gentlemen, and by the way, these customs are to apply to the, to the upper classes, uh, the way that Wilson envisions them, but if, if a gentleman were to call another gentleman a liar, for instance, the second gentleman should never, ever, ever respond 
No, you're the liar. Um, what about ism was absolutely forbidden. Instead, um, and by the way, this also applied to one thing that, that was almost impossible not to duel over uh, was being physically struck with a hand. If you were hit, if somebody hit you with a hand or a stick uh, and you were a gentleman, um, to maintain your honor, you had to challenge to a duel, but not to hit back. You didn't hit back. You said, oh, I accept. And at that point, you said that your friend will see his friend about making arrangements. And from then on, the principals, the two guys that are going to fight, they are considered sort of like the bride and groom being kept apart before the wedding. They're not supposed to talk to each other or send a note directly from one to the other. Uh, they are to be kept apart. And there's a reason for that. And in John Lyde Wilson's code, the whole idea there is that the seconds have the important responsible job. The seconds are supposed to calm things down, talk together, and reach an understanding that can prevent the duel by both of their principles agreeing through intermediaries. Well, what if, if my guy clarifies that when he said this, he didn't mean that, would that be good enough for your guy? Well, my guy says you must re withdraw this certain word in particular. Well, I'll check with my guy and see if that's okay. That was the idea that the hostile meeting, as it was called, uh, that the duel could be prevented by the seconds. There's a problem with the whole concept here. The problem was that the principals choose the seconds. And you were very likely to choose someone who had just as much of a grudge as you did against the other principal. So that could lead in bad directions. Um, uh, Maxie Gregg, later a general, when he was a young man, Maxie Gregg was a second appointed for a duel. And before he was done meeting with the other second to make arrangements, um, they had challenged each other and there was gonna be a, another duel between the seconds, exactly the way John Lyde Wilson did not want it to go. Uh, a couple of great excerpts from his book to give you the, the tone, the flavor of how he wanted things done. Uh, and these are both from the same chapter, chapter five, the duties of the principles and seconds on the ground. Uh, the principles are to be respectful in meeting. Now in meeting, this is the actual meeting at the dueling ground, they're gonna fight. The principles are to be respectful in meeting and neither by look or expression irritate each other. So it's okay to shoot him, but no give him stank eye. They are to be wholly passive, being entirely under the guidance of their seconds. They're just supposed to do what they're told. When once posted, they're quitting their place for the fight. They're not to quit their position under any circumstances without leave or direction of the seconds. Now, this next bit, what happens the, uh, in the duel when they call for fire? How that goes is fire, one, two, three, Stop. So um, it's legal to shoot only in between the word fire and the word stop. Uh, anything else, the seconds are standing next to the other guy's principle. If you are the second of uh, the major who's fighting the colonel, you stand next to the colonel. And the seconds have pistols too. And they are supposed to shoot anybody who breaks the rules. So after that exchange of shots, each person who's fired one shot, rule six kicks in. 
If after an exchange of shots, neither party be hit, it is the duty of the second of the challenge E to approach the second of the challenger and say, our friends have exchanged shots. Are you satisfied? Or is there any cause why the contest should be continued? So even after shots have been exchanged, the seconds are still supposed to be trying to help this whole thing happen without anybody getting hurt. Uh, and that results in one of my favorite of the South Carolina dueling stories. Um, Colonel James Dickinson and Major John Smart of Camden, South Carolina, they fight a duel in 1840. Now, Camden was uh, well known as a enthusiastic dueling town. Uh, and maybe because of that, it also had an active anti-dueling society that was trying to get rid of this custom. But Dickinson and Smart uh, had had a falling out. They were both lawyers. Uh, it was often lawyers and journalists who wound up in duels in South Carolina. And these men met despite their seconds doing their best to try to keep the fight from happening. They met in Camden. Now, Camden was well known for something called the Iron Man. The Iron Man was a practice target for um, duelists. The Iron Man was a silhouette target. And so it is the shape of a man standing sideways because that was a target of a duel. There was also a gravestone in one of the uh, graveyards around Camden that was used for the same purpose. Back to my share here. So, both of these men were known to practice and were renowned pistol shots and officers in the militia. So it was to everybody's great surprise, the two met, two fires were exchanged. So they, they shot at each other once, they shot at each other again, the second time when the rule six was followed and a second said, to um, Dickinson, sir, are you satisfied? Dickinson looked at his pistol as if it was defective and said, satisfied, disgusted. Well, folks in the crowd began to laugh. The seconds began to, ch began to chuckle. And finally, both of the principals laughed, um, put down their pistols, walked together and shook hands thus ending the Dickinson Smart duel without anybody getting hurt. Other duels were much more tragic in nature. Uh, the duel which occurred in the early 1830s at South Carolina College between two students who were known to be friends uh, over who had touched a plate of trout first. You see, they were serving trout for dinner, and the custom was whoever touched the serving plate first could choose his portion first, and they disagreed about who had touched it first, and I guess somebody got mad enough to call the other one a liar. Well, the peer pressure then for them to shoot it out uh, was so strong that these two young men did that. Uh, one of them killed the other in that duel, and then um, went on to uh, commit suicide some months later. Uh, so it, it killed one young man and traumatized the shooter so much that uh, that duel ended two young lives. Uh, precisely the direction that people like John Light Wilson didn't want duels to go and precisely the direction that members of the anti-dueling societies expected it to go very tragic circumstance. Another duel, um, which ended in a happier fashion, was among members of Hart's Battery, which was a Confederate unit during the war. Now, 
several times we have stories during the war of South Carolinian officers, always officers, uh, fighting duels during the war as if they didn't have enough danger in battle, uh, a personal quarrel would be something they would risk their lives over. But in this case, it was two young men of Hart's battery, uh, artillery, and they had a falling out very late in the war. It was spring of 1865, approaching the Battle of Bentonville. Uh, the unit had lost a lot of people. It had been through a lot of misery. And when these two young men had their falling out and decided that they were going to formally shoot it out the next morning, they left the campfire and went to their respective tents, but their buddies sitting around the campfire stayed up and concocted a plan. The next morning, the duel was um, carried out according to all of the formal procedures. Um, Cohen's and Chu's seconds, Verdier and Razor, were either the best seconds around or the worst, depending on who you asked. They had a very particular idea of the outcome they wanted from the duel, and they took steps. They took care of all the arrangements, so the next morning, when camp was astir at the break of day, things were ready for the principals, Chu and Cohen, in this fight to take their positions. Expressions were grim, faces somber on the witnesses and the young men intent on killing each other. At the word, both Cohen and Chu emptied their pistols. When things were said and done, both men were uninjured. Their anger faded with the fading smoke and they declared their satisfaction. But as they returned to camp, bemused, Cohen remarked to his second, Verdier, on how strange it was that no bullets had struck. Well, the second knew very well why no bullets had struck. The young men had been provided with pistols loaded with gunpowder with no bullet. Uh, by the way, that rumor also had circulated over the Dickinson Smart duel earlier that the seconds had sabotaged it. Although in that case, I don't believe it for a minute. Some things that South Carolinians fought duels over. There were duels fought over newspaper columns in two directions. Uh, two newspaper editors fought over the issue of nullification that they were arguing in their columns. Uh, but another thing that would be art would cause a duel would be slander in print. In fact, if you wanted to provoke somebody, you could threaten him that you're going to put uh, buy an ad. It was called posting a coward to buy an ad in which you just said what an unworthy human being he was, unless he accepted your challenge to a duel. Uh, this failed, by the way, on one Georgia man who was told if he would not fight uh, that I will fill a column of the newspaper with you. And the man replied, go ahead. I'd rather fill a dozen newspapers than one coffin. But not everyone had that idea. A chess game. Colonel Albert Bland fought Major Siebel's. Colonel and Major, by the way, seemed to be dueling ranks for some reason. Um, Colonel... Bland and Major Siebels fought over a chess game. And I had always thought that uh, that was because one of them had been accused of cheating. It turned out that was not the case at all. Bland moved a piece. Siebels said, well, Albert, that was a stupid move. Albert Bland said, it wasn't stupid. And he looked at it. And he said, it may have been imprudent, but it wasn't stupid. Sable said, no, Albert, that was stupid. He would not withdraw the word stupid, even though a group of officers convened a board to settle the disagreement and recommended that he characterize the move as imprudent, but not stupid. Sables would not take it back. And the next day, uh, Albert Bland shot him, not fatally. Uh, and there's another rule in John Lyde Wilson's book that says 
that whoever uh, wins should immediately offer any assistance possible to the man he has wounded. As the story goes, now we can't prove this part, as the story goes, Major Siebel's lying on the ground, uh, Colonel Bland, who was a doctor in uh, private life, Dr. Bland uh, supposedly had his second say to him, uh, Colonel Bland believes that honor is satisfied. He would like to offer his services as a physician and that Siebel's before he passed out said, you tell Albert, he served me quite enough for one day. I already mentioned the fight over a plate of trout and only recently I found out about a fight 10 years after the war between two former officers over whose fault it was that Columbia was burned. These have all been fighting topics in South Carolina. The last of the South Carolina duels was the Cash-Shannon duel in the 1880s. Uh, Colonel Cash and Colonel Shannon, both former officers, this duel came from a lawsuit. And Colonel Cash killed his opponent in the last of South Carolina's, uh, or should I say, the last duel in South Carolina to this date. South Carolina still has on the books an anti-dueling law, as well as a specification that you are not eligible to run for office if you have ever been in a duel. In fact, uh, an opponent tried to use this at one point against none other than uh, Strom Thurmond alleging that since Strom Thurmond had once been in a fist fight, which had been arranged ahead of time, so meet me out back, and then they met on purpose, that that constituted a duel. Uh, that was thrown out. It does not, uh, I don't recommend, but, but it doesn't violate the anti-dueling statutes. So I'll tell you what, before we get to that part, I'm going to stop share for a minute and take some time with these wonderful artifacts that have been pulled for us today by our registrar. Good morning, you're on television. I guess my cover's blown. Um, all right, that duel held by Hart's Battery in 1865, the chances are very strong that the pistols used for that duel would have been this model. It's very unlikely that the men had personalized dueling pistols that they were using in an event like that. This is a Palmetto Armory issued single shot gun uh, and this model of pistol, uh, by the 1860s, you know, revolvers are favored for cavalry service. And many of these single shot pistols wound up in the um, equipping, you know, basically in the boxes, in the limbers of an artillery unit, uh, because it was an excellent gun for putting a wounded animal out of its misery. But it was also a single shot percussion cap pistol. And uh, take a second and contemplate. That's not small caliber. I believe this is a 54 caliber weapon. And that would have been a terrifying thing to think about having aimed at you in a personal quarrel. The dueling stance again was side on to give as little target as possible. And a few dancing related artifacts that were come up with from our collection. This pair of shoes worn at a wedding. This dates from the 1880s. You can't feel how light they are, but uh, very elegant, very 
very light footed, I think you would be in these nice little shoes. Let's, ladies will be interested in the heel of the shoe as well. You can imagine what that surface would be like. You get good, good swift pivots there. Hopefully you wouldn't, wouldn't run away with you down the floor. But we know of dances and one of my favorite South Carolina anecdotes about a dance during the war I found involve men wearing big monster boots like this one. Now this particular boot belonged to a man who was a staff officer, but it's pretty, pretty typical. It's a high quality boot. And there's this wonderful account from the diary at Pushi Plantation. Just a passing reference to a, a dance that was held really after the end of the war. When Sherman passed through South Carolina, um, capturing various places uh, and sometimes destroying them, but not leaving garrisons around everywhere to occupy territory that he'd captured. Uh, and so local forces kind of moved back in as militia and even vigilantes in places where he'd already passed through. A lady wrote, the Confederate scouts who formed our patrol and police were wild and irresponsible men, although brave and honorable. Their captain, a son of Governor Pettus of Mississippi, was a youth of 19. Except for them, the country between us and Charleston, after its fall, was at the mercy of bands of stragglers who burned and pillaged recklessly. At last, the time came when our faithful band of Confederate scouts was recalled. In fact, the war was over. And I suppose they really had no longer any recognized position, but were only bushwhackers. Indeed, liable to be hung or shot if caught. Therefore, it was determined to give them a farewell party at Mrs. Palmer's house, Springfield. There were about 30 scouts at the party and their horses were picketed close to the piazza. Their guns stacked in the corners of the large bare drawing room and they danced with pistols stuck in their boot tops, which gave them a dashing look. Now, the custom of the dance card and of the dance card being a souvenir, well, this one isn't in the greatest shape. But this is Spanish American War period for a dance to be given by the officers of the second Mississippi Volunteer Infantry. Uh, and this dance is happening in Florida where troops are being mustered to go for the Spanish American War. And then we have a dance invitation. Last dance of the USS Columbia given by the crew in honor of Captain Helwig, USN commanding. Many times you'll hear things from our museum uh, about the legacy of the USS Columbia light cruiser CL-56. This is not one of those things. This is not a World War II light cruiser. It is a World War I protected cruiser. And this last dance before the ship's decommissioning is May 18th of 1921. So here we see dances that are popular in that time, roster of officers, and this dance card was never used, but it has spaces for who's gonna dance. All 38 dances that are scheduled for the evening. All of these by 1921 are couple dances and not uh, group dances. And only one tune is specified, the last waltz will be done to the tune, Home Sweet Home. 
So these artifacts give us a connection with the past and another connection uh, with the past of these two different kinds of customs we talked about today uh, is to participate in their modern derivatives. Uh, we already talked about how English country dance, contra dance, Scottish country dance, square dance, by the way. Square dance's movements are very often identical to English country dances, just called by different names and done to different music. Uh, but remembering the side on stance of the duel and its formalized nature, uh, both bullseye pistol, the Olympic sport, uh, as well as um, the Olympic sport of air pistol uh, are carried out in the fashion of the old time pistol duel. Uh, they developed the same skills uh, and a, a version of being accurate under pressure without risking your or anybody else's lives. Uh, and those are activities that derive directly from the duel. Uh, but here's a home activity suggestion for those of you that want to go the extra mile in your curriculum. Um, I suggest that you pick up a couple of Nerf pistols. This activity is not to be done with any other form of simulator, certainly not with airsoft or BB gun. But two young men with the Nerf pistols can sit down with a copy of John Lyde Wilson's Code of Honor, derive the rules, and see if you can't simulate a proper duel. So uh, if you want some suggestions on how to do that, feel free to email me. If you want to see it done, uh, then be looking for our dueling and dancing activity next December when we get back on our normal track. So thank you all for spending some time with history this morning uh, with special thanks to our uh, registrar Chelsea for pulling us some cool artifacts. And I hope that next time you see an account of a duel or a dance in someone's biography, uh, in a diary, in a history book, or in a, a piece of literature or a movie, you have a little more perspective.